Hey, it's Broken Office Chair, a podcast produced by Alternatives. Broken Office Chair is hosted by Alternatives Executive Director, Bessie Alcantara. Bessie is a Chicago native, first-generation Salvadoran Mexican-American who's passionate about dismantling systemic racism. In each episode, Bessie will be joined by her friends and colleagues who are ready to speak candidly about their experiences as people of color in their various professions. In the episodes, they'll address topics such as issues in the nonprofit sector, racial equity, DEI in practice, and much, much more. So stay tuned. Today, I am joined by Dr. Cynthia Treadwell, Executive Director at Social Emotional Learning at CPS. Thanks for joining me. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me and inviting me. Looking forward to our time together today. Cool. So am I. So I know we wanted to talk a little bit about education to get us kicked off. Why don't you tell us a little bit about why you got into the field of education? So you're going to make me go back to being two or three. <laughs> Um, my that was only 10 years ago, right? So. Just about 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my aunt talks about when I was a little girl um, in the neighborhood, we would play. Um, but she recalls me often saying that I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to be a teacher. Um, and I think she was right. Um, anytime we played rock teacher, um, and that's a game we used to play in my neighborhood where whoever owned the rock was the teacher and could tell all of the other kids what to do. So anytime we played rock teacher, I had to be the teacher. So I ran to get the rock often. Um, I can remember I had a younger brother, um, and I would make him summer packets. So I would ask my teachers at the end of the school year for the old books so that I can make him a summer packet every summer. And he would tell my mom, Cynthia's making me do this summer packet. And he had to. I would grade it. I would give him a grade. Um, and so as long as I can remember, I always wanted to be an educator. I never wanted to do anything else. When I went away to school, um, that was what I signed up to do. I immediately declared my major as education um, and never wanted to do anything else. And so it has been my heart's passion for as long as I can remember to engage in that um, type of capacity. And um, so here I am 23 years later in education and loving it and all as most most aspects of it. But um, just being able to see, you know, light bulbs go off for kids and and adults is what brings me joy now. Not playing rock teacher, but definitely (laughs) still being a teacher in some capacity. So that's kind of how I got into education. So I have to say I'm a little jealous. I'm always jealous of folks who knew right away what they wanted to do. I graduated college and still didn't know what I wanted to do. Mm. And so it took me a really, really long time. Um, Has the teaching go how you expected it to go? When I was a classroom teacher? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, that was probably my most favorite job prior to being a principal. Um, It did. I was hired to teach a fifth grade class. Um, at this point in time, they had four different teachers. So this was September to December. Um, so a very rambunctious class. Um, and so I was not scared. I was a young, you know, 20 something year old, you know, I want to give my age away. (laughs) Um, and I heard all of the horror stories about this class and, um, I went in over Christmas break, cleaned up the room organized it, got it ready for them to return from Christmas break. And my colleagues at the time said within a week's time, they were not the same group of kids. And they weren't. Um, To this day, 20 something years later, I still keep in contact with them. Um, They often post about me being their favorite teacher. Um, And again, like I said earlier, just seeing that light bulb go off and doing the unthinkable with kids that people deemed unfit or unable to accomplish we ended up being the class that year who had the highest growth on the Iowa test I'm dating myself we don't do Iowa (laughs) tests anymore Um, but we had the highest growth that year um, and they were a phenomenal class and so I would like to say that it did go the way I expected Um, but I what I've learned over my career is that I learn more from them than I think they actually learn from me and so they constantly cultivate me to become a better educator so yeah 
what do you think that you did differently in comparison to other folks that because you said that was the whole you had heard rumors right yeah, yeah. and so what do you think that you did differently to approach them um I think I I took time to build relationships with them um and I didn't allow the narratives that I was told about who they were to dictate how I would treat them um they were little people who needed guidance support and structure um and I provided that so once we got through the you know the preliminaries of this is how we do class here um, we were able to do awesome learning and they I had so many bright kids in there they were overshadowed by the narratives um, and they went on to do amazing things you know post high school post grad school all that good stuff um, but I think it was the relationships that we were able to cultivate right away um, we considered ourselves a family in that classroom unapologetically and so they worked that way, I led that way, and we operated that way. Um, it's so funny, um, I ended up looping with them when they became seventh graders. The principal asked me to come up to seventh grade, um, so I did, had the exact same class. Um, and if anyone tried to infiltrate our class, they would not allow anyone else in because they felt that strongly about our family unit. Um, and so we would have family meetings, and so again, the core of that was relationships. So I got to know each and every one of them on an individual level so that I could push what was happening for them on the academic level. For my own curiosity, um, the demographics of this class, what did that look like? Like what did their families at home look like? Absolutely. Um, poverty, mm -hmm. um, low income, low socio socioeconomic status. Um, it was the Woodlawn area before you know, regentrification, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of my families actually were being pushed out for that reason um, at that time. Um, so all African American students, um, yeah. So low. what did the teachers look like? Primarily African American as well. There were a few Caucasian mm -hmm. teachers in the building, very few, but primarily African American. Do you think you talk a little bit about um, creating that family environment? Do you think that you were providing something that maybe they were not necessarily getting in their community or in their home? What's interesting is um, most of my students, their families were really engaged. Mm -hmm. So I can't say that that was the case. Um, however, many of their parents were young. I was young. Um, I feel like they saw something or they received something that they didn't get I can't name it all the time mm -hmm. like what it was but I know they gravitated towards our classroom our community and me in a way that I didn't see with other educators um, to the point some of them you know they stayed with me over the course of my career and they feel like they're my family now right and so it's kind of still that same essence um, and so I don't know, I think it was maybe just the love that was shown in a, in a space where traditionally they didn't receive that, that really caused them to latch on. I appreciate the clarification because I think oftentimes when we think about kids who have issues in school, we always society has this default narrative that the parents are not engaged. Oh, no, they were really engaged. Right. Yeah. And so it's a thing that we often have for it's this conversation that we tend to have about individual responsibility versus structures and yeah. support systems, right? And so sometimes the family can be present and the school still is not set up in a way to support the kids, right? And so that's why I just wanted to make sure that we had an idea of what the family home life looks like. No, they were two-parent homes. They were working families. They had careers. Like, they, they ran the gamut. Um, and anytime I called for anything, good, bad, or indifferent, they were there. Like, I didn't have parents that were, you know, dismissive about what was happening with their child. They wanted to actively participate. Um, and I won't say that was for the entire collective, but the majority, absolutely, they were there. So, I, yeah, to this day, I still talk to those parents, too, because they were actively a part of that classroom community as well. They were an extension of what we had within the classroom walls. So fast forward a few sure. years, because it's only been a couple of years, right? <laughs> Just uh, a couple. So you are in a very different role now. Very different. Talk a little bit about that. So this role is, I'm the executive director for the Office of Social and Emotional Learning for Chicago Public Schools. And 
Um, it's a unique position in that um, I oversee what happens for social emotional learning for the entire district, so pre-K to 12. Um, and so I'm excited about the role because my passion and what has transformed every school that I've ever worked in is social emotional learning, right? So yes, I'm passionate about it, I'm excited, it's great. Um, and it gives me an opportunity to ensure that every school has access to what I deemed important in my school, right, for students and staff. And so, um, yeah, we get to ensure that schools have curriculum, they have access to prof professional learning, um, they have access to conferences and things of that nature to really enhance their knowledge around social emotional learning. Um, and so it's access and opportunity. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm elated to uh, be the predecessor to some great, amazing women that led this work before me. But um, yes, yeah, taking a turn, right? Social emotional learning is a can be a combative topic, mm -hmm. but um, the way we see it as it is the plate in which we serve everything else on in the district. And so, if we don't have social and emotional uh, well being first and foremost, um, students really don't learn that way. So, so there is a lot of criticism yeah. of CPS in general. What are some of the challenges that you've encountered in implementing some of the work? Specifically from a social emotional learning lens is really mindset, right? Mm -hmm. That's probably the first and the most glaring one is what we believe and perceive social emotional learning is or is not. Um, some liken it, liken it to critical race theory, um, it's racism packaged with a bow, it's a lot of things, right? The truth of the matter is, it is really those 21st century learning skills that everyone needs to know how to do, right? How, are you socially aware, right? Can you make responsible, responsible decisions? Um, how do you engage in relationships with people? Like, so no matter where you are in life, you need those skills. And so I would say mindset is the first thing. Um, beyond mindset, it's um, a willingness to do something different, right? A lot of educators, when you've been in education for, I think, beyond five years, you can be considered veteran, right? Um, and by that, you feel like you know exactly what your kids need at this time and that's it and teachers can become very um, starchy in their approach to education and so when you talk about social emotional learning it's like well I don't have time for that they need to learn and so that mindset and that unwillingness is sometimes a barrier to implementation around social emotional learning so I would say those are my biggest two um, because as a district, what we've done is we've, re we've taken away the barrier of access, right? We've purchased for everyone um, access to curriculum. We provide professional development for everyone. So that part is not there. Um, it's really that mindset and that willingness. So skill versus will. So one of the things that we've noticed is that there are a lot of efforts to um, – like you said, create access and give opportunity, and yet the historic inequities within the CPS system have continued to come up. And so how have you been seeing that affect black and brown kids? Wow, so it, it's, it's very glaring, right? Um, depending on um, where your school is located, specifically for black and brown students, um, one of the ways that it immediately shows up is the overuse of suspension and expulsion um, for our black and brown kids. And if I'm honest, again, I've been with the district for a number of years, and this has been the topic of discussion for quite some time. And what we have not been able to do is figure out where that mindset comes from, that if a student is misbehaving, then you just suspend. If they won't obey or submit to the rules and regulations of a school building, we suspend or we expel. What I have found is that most often, as I talked a little bit about earlier, is that students want a sense and need a sense of connectedness and well-being and belonging in any community, and not just kids, adults too, right? Mm -hmm. um, I always say that people don't leave um, jobs, they leave bosses, and right? And so when you make it very challenging for students and or adults, to um, feel connected and, and, and well in a space, um, it makes it very challenging for them. And so often they will want to leave. And so 
that in black and brown communities, there is an overuse of suspension and expulsion by way of control, right? It's, it's my go-to because I can. It's a power um, dynamic. And so, and I can't just say it's in black and brown communities. It's, it's in any community where black and brown kids are served, right? Mm-hmm. We see that suspension data or that expulsion data when it's extracted in other communities, those kids are the ones being suspended. Um, and I can't remember the name of who wrote this quote, but I, I saw it at a conference and I said, it, it is very true. It said, if a kid can't read, we teach them. If a kid can't write, we teach them. If a kid can't do math, we teach them. If a kid can't behave, we suspend. And so somewhere along the line, we come to education with the expectation that kids are supposed to know how to behave. And it's just not true. I had, a, so really earlier, like much earlier in my career, I was talking to a school and we were talking about uh, like educational services with the goal of getting um, young people into college. Mm-hmm. And they were talking to us about taking on um, the freshman class because another provider already had the other classes. And um, one of the things that they said to us was, you know, some of these kids, a lot of these kids are just not going to go to college. And so do you have anything else for them? And so I got kicked under the table by my program director at the time because I, I'm like, how do you decide a 14-year-old is just not going to go to college? So let's just not even address that topic with them. And it always stood out to me how these were administrators in the room how they had already lost hope in a 14 year old. And I started off this conversation by saying, I didn't even know what I wanted to do until post college. Um, But you've already made a decision for that child's life at 14. Low expectations, right, is the first thing that comes to mind. And I think it sits in low expectations. Um, And again, it's not a white or black thing, Mm -hmm. right? I've talked with educators, um, principal colleagues, with that same mindset around a kid. And so we immediately deem them, you know, they can't go to college, they won't accomplish anything based on a moment in time. Um, And this might sound a little um, crazy. I I remember having conversations with some of my staff members when I was a principal and I would say to them, if I treated you that same way when you're late, you don't turn in your lesson plans on time, your, your your pacing is off, all of those things. If I deemed you unfit to teach, how would you feel? And they, will, of course, would say, I, I wouldn't like it. And say, how do we do that to kids, right? It's a moment in time. And so how do we express compassion and support where there's a lack or a need, right? You need me to give you grace in this space, right? Because you, all of these things are not done kids need the same thing for some reason in education we come to the table with the mindset that kids already have everything the truth of the matter is you're an adult and you don't right right like it's crazy it's mindset for me and we know from brain research their brain isn't even fully developed until they're 25 and so how do we have an expectation on kids that we don't even have of ourselves so saying things like that to my staff it would challenge them because they knew they couldn't just say, well, Cynthia is, she's done. There's nothing I can do for her. No. What else do we need to do? What are we not thinking about? What are the needs? What are the supports? And a lot of times, honestly, it's set in that emotional well-being, right? If everyone around me believes that I can't, then it's that self-fulfilled prophecy then. I can't. And so how do we change that narrative for kids? And it really goes, again, back to that mindset and believing that every child can. I remember having to write my philosophy of education paper and my first line is, I believe all children can and will be able to learn. And I'm sure if you ask most educators, they have that somewhere in their Mm -hmm. philosophy of education. Somewhere along the line, they lost it. And it's probably under the umbrella of a a not well-behaved child or a child who won't succumb to their rules and regulations. Classrooms are not for kids they they're set up for adults and what adults want and need and 
I just think it's not supposed to be that way. They're supposed to be student centered, right? Um, I remember one boss I had at one point took all of the teacher desk out of the classroom. And teachers came back that year and they were hot. Who took my desk? Well, they because they would set up the room just for them, um, when they didn't no longer had that and they had to create a space that was more feasible for students, by the end of the year, they saw like, you know what, I don't need this because this is taking away from kids having access to and being able to do what they need and making it a functional space for them. And so again, mindset and belief, right? If, if I don't say anything else today, like I'll center most of my um, heart's passion and education around mindset and belief um, because that's where it hits the wall is my ability to see beyond the problem. How much do you think that mindset and belief has to do with the structure itself like we've talked about in, you know prior to today how um, the teaching model may not necessarily meet all kids but that's our model the demands on test scores the classroom sizes the lack of resources teachers having to come out of their own pocket for supplies and of textbooks being out of date all these other barriers that teachers are encountering how much do you think it has to do with that that it's impacting their ability to see that child holistically i think it plays a role mm -hmm. but a very small role right um if I go back to my first classroom, resource we were res we had a resource deficit for sure. Um, we just did not have the funds to do. So I did spend a lot of my own money. I did, um, you know, tap in other people. Hey, can you buy this for me? All of those things. Um, but that did not stop me from ensuring the academic success of every student in that classroom. Really, it fueled it for me. Um, so I think it's a piece of the puzzle. It's just not the whole puzzle. Um, and from a structural standpoint, a district standpoint, um, over the years, from a budgetary need, the district has really tried to ensure that schools have what they need, right? The tricky part is, um, is that the decision-making then lies in the, the hands of the school leader and how they allocate their funds. And so my last school that I was at was a very small school, and you know CPS is per pupil funding, and so you do the math. Mm -hmm. I had low students, I mean, um, low student enrollment, which means I didn't have a large budget. But um, if you know how to balance a checkbook and you can make two pennies rub together, I was able to make it work. Um, and each year we increased our student enrollment, so we got more funds and we were able to keep adding. But it's really, it sits in the, the decision making of that school leader to decide how to spend those funds and to really relieve that pressure for the teacher so that they don't have to worry about some of those pieces. Um, and that was really my heart's passion is if I can remove every barrier for you from curriculum to supplies to basic needs so that you could just teach, which was, that was my goal. And so I did it. My six years there, every year my budget was designed around meeting the needs of students and adults so that it would no longer be a barrier. And so um, it's challenging and no one teaches you how to do that, right? They don't sit you down and say, this is how you have to do your budget. They leave it up to you as a school leader. And so prioritizing students and student needs as well as the adults who are gonna to have to support those needs um, will kind of remove that barrier. But again, it's still only a small piece of the puzzle. Now, I will say there's some other structural, bigger things that impact what happen in schools that are just out of everyone's control, right? And you're talking about from a governmental standpoint, a bureaucratic standpoint, um, the mayor making decisions, um, things like that that are just out of our control. But if you control what you can, like that one bucket or two buckets that you have, those things are minute in the bigger, the bigger scope of the work. I want to go back to your comment about classrooms are not set up for kids, they're set up for teachers. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit more about that? Sure. If you've ever visited a classroom, and I'm going to assume that you have, um, you will notice that oftentimes the way the desks are set up the way um, students are seated, the way in which the teacher designs their classroom. Again, they have free choice in how they design their room. You will notice that most of the space is designed for the teacher use and not the student. 
um, from flexible seating to the way the chairs are set, the way they position themselves to instruct their students, to bean bags and bookshelves, all of those things are decision points for teachers. And either it's very teacher-centric or student-centric. Um, and in spaces where student-centric, you see more student artifacts, you see way more flexible seating, you see chairs and desks and access to materials. Um, I remember visiting some rooms where there were a lack of books on the bookshelf for kids to read, but they were told to do independent reading. How? That's more teacher-centered. So like I don't, pro t in teacher-centered spaces, the materials, resources, and tools are not available for students to just easily use. Um, another example, this is probably my favorite, is when the rules or expectations are so rigid that students have to ask teachers to use and do. Um, one of my most provocative decisions, <laughs> I think, and something very small is students having to ask to go to the bathroom. That's a human right. Mm -hmm. And how do I get to say to you that you can't go now? That's a teacher-centered or even school-centered decision that hinders um, or really impedes on kids, right? I've, I've seen a number of kids have accidents in schools because the teacher just said, no, you don't have to go. That's awful. Beyond awful, yeah. right? But that's where you get that adult mindset around my ability to control and determine what you do, when you do it, how you do it, based on the structure in my room, um, is more teacher-centered. You just unlocked a core memory. Um, I was, so I was in public schools for up until the fourth grade, and that's it. But one of my teachers did not allow me to go to the bathroom, and I was actually um, nauseous. So mm -hmm. I threw up on his jacket. I was like, that was one way to get it out the way. I bet you he didn't deny somebody else going to the bathroom in the future. Yeah, but it, that's a power thing, right? Like, I can tell you when to get a pencil, when mm -hmm. to get a book, when to do all these things, when to go to the restroom. And you're right, like, sometimes kids do, you know, leverage their right in a way um, that says, no, I'm going to go do this. And so when teachers are focused on, or schools are focused on, controlling kids and not really supporting their identity and their needs then you see things like throwing up on a teacher's jacket <laughs> it was in the way i was trying to get around him. i'm sure i'm sure but that's a real yeah. thing right um this is an interesting topic i mentioned to you that i went to particularly high school I went to a private school and we had more of a montessori style of teaching and um it it was my introduction High school was my introduction to a more strengths-based perspective. One of the things that stood out to me was I had a class where um, we were allowed to turn in our assignments based on our strengths. So you can write a paper, you can sing a song, you can do a video, you can write a poem, whatever. And it was a uh, draw a picture as long as you met the uh, needs of the assignment. I was debating things like euthanasia and abortion at the age of 14, and we were talking about that. We were talking about human rights in different countries and watching videos, I was taken to my first structural racism workshop at 15. And um, I don't have a lot of memories of sitting down and being taught. I have a lot of memories of engaging with my peers and teachers. And that's why I asked, like, how, what do you think the classroom should look like? Because I, th for me, I feel like if I had a the few the few years that I was in public school, one of the reasons my mom took me out of public school is because every year I got into trouble. Hmm. Every single year. I talked too much. And um, I was always talking to my peer. I was not doing my assignments. Um, in um, fourth grade, I was told I was reading at a kindergarten level. So my mom went to go get me tested. It turned out I was reading at an eighth grade level. Wow. But it was lost because I was lost amongst all the kids. And so she took me out and put, and she was able to have that resource because one of her employers paid for my ability to go to private school, right? And so I think about this decision-making point that my mom was able to have to put me in a setting that was more accommodating to me. And I was 
a mess of a, a kid. So let's also just be clear about that. Um, and I think for me in my career tra tra trajectory later in life, that made all the difference. And so I wonder from your perspective, what could happen differently in a classroom for these kids? So you just named the ideal state, right? Is where kids have autonomy, um, they have access, they have interests, they have strengths that are leveraged. I was talking to a colleague the other day about their own child, and she was going through a list of things that she was gonna do with him this summer to prepare him for the next grade, and some of the challenges he faced and in, in school, in turning in assignments and I said to her to your point I said well why don't you ask the teacher if he could do auditory um, submission for exams versus paper and pencil because he really struggles with that he gets anxious and she's like they won't allow him to and I just I was so bothered by that because I think about the number of kids that are either overlooked or not supported because I can't do paper and pencil but if you ask me I can tell you exactly what this story was about, or I can tell you how to solve this mathematical problem, or I could do a project that can display my knowledge. And so I, an ideal classroom would allow for all aspects of those learning modalities to be accessed. Um, and again, in a teacher-centric classroom, and I, I'll keep using that, mm -hmm. is most teachers wanted uh, paper pencil so that they can either, you got it wrong or right, but when you talk to a kid, right, and have a conversation, you realize that every kid is a different expression of humanity. And so the way we are currently doing school um, boxes them into a way that real society, society doesn't really, um, you know, support, right? There are people who go around the world and learn, and they just become historians, historians of what they learn. Um, we have someone here in Chicago, he calls himself the Chicago historian. He can recite all of the history in Chicago, not from a piece of paper, but what he's, he's learned through going through the different communities across the city of Chicago. And he tells his story of how he struggled in school because he had to do paper and pencil, but it wasn't until he got to college and he asked the professor, could he recite it? versus paper and pencil and the, the professor said you're gonna have to do a 40 minute presentation he's like oh that's it i got that <laughs> but he could and i literally watched this man maybe two months ago get up for 40 minutes and recite chicago history in a very powerful way um and that's just an example now he's an adult struggling with that right but our kids in classrooms today are being forced to sit and regurgitate information that's not real learning right your ability to say all that you learned and did and experienced because it was experiential, right? You, mm -hmm. you learned by doing. And that's Dewey's model that is so antiquated that any student coming through an education program, you're gonna learn about Dewey. Um, and that's what he talks about, learning by doing. And so um, how do we investigate our current way of doing things? Um, and if I'm honest, the pandemic was an opportunity for us to pivot and create those spaces. We had to become very creative because of the pandemic. And then we went right back to traditional mm -hmm. education. And I was just like, we missed an opportunity to really engage kids because kids had to do a variety of things in order to show what they learned, right? It wasn't just paper and pencil. You had to use a variety of means to show what you learned. And so if you ask me, I actually felt, and I had this conversation with one of my friends that I actually thought that school should just shut down for that year, for the first year. Agreed. And allow schools and administrators to really rethink curriculum because what we're doing is not working. Yep. And we're not leading, you know, the world in test scores and math and all these different things that are benchmarks for learning. This idea that we have to graduate by a certain age is ours. Other school systems look very different. Yep. And it was very frustrating to me that we were trying to force a normal that didn't has never worked yep. even pre-pandemic did not work agreed agreed wholeheartedly um i struggle with that even now um with my own children right um my children have been in traditional schooling for quite some time and i am at the point now of deciding if that's the best avenue for my own children because i'm realizing post-pandemic that they shifted. 
Like the kids shifted, the adults didn't. Mm-hmm. The kids shifted. They were ready for something different. They, you know, all of the aspects of how we began to do things. And you're right. We definitely should have shut down the entire first year to rethink it. Um, but we are full-fledged ahead with the traditional model. Um, and to your point, we're not going to see what we're looking for from a data standpoint because we're assessing kids in a very antiquated way from a, to say they learned or did not learn. But I've had some of the most powerful conversations with kids about what they've learned, how they view the world, just through conversation mm-hmm. or a drawing. You know, they come. They used to come into my office with a drawing. I'm like, hmm, what's that? Right? It's very mm-hmm. abstract. But their imagination to tell me a story about this one picture, and it's probably sticks and circles, but the, <laughs> and it would be, but their imagination would just go places. Um, and it was just enlightening. And I think I said earlier, I learned more from my students than they probably learned from me, and that's as a teacher and as a principal because I was constantly cultivating and thinking about more um, ways that would allow them to express who they are and their uniqueness and in their own individual identity. So, yeah, I think it was a missed opportunity, honestly. I also think about, like, our teaching model and what it it teaches folks about who they are as people. Because if you think about it, right, you get the test score and you have this cutoff, this arbitrary cutoff, whether it's 80%, 75%, whatever, right? And you have this letter score and or you have a paper and it's less about content a lot of times and more about grammar especially when you're younger Mm -hmm. and we have all these little grades at the end of the year you get your a b c d f and then based on what that looks like you're either a good student or a bad student and then we have adults in the workforce that can't admit mistakes and we're like why can't you admit a mistake like you're trying to deprogram so many years of labeling folks and they're being taught these labels yeah and what they carry into their adulthood. It's a sense of perfectionism, right? right? That yeah. has been groomed for years. And you're absolutely right. I work with adults who cannot admit a mistake or they feel like they're going to get fired. I'm like, no, it's okay. A mistake is an opportunity to learn. Let's talk through it. And they're unable to. And age has no barrier to their ability to do that. I've talked with more senior people and much younger and you're absolutely right that letter grade has defined them that sense of perfectionism getting it right has defined them um and it i think what it does is it it makes um i'm I'm losing the word that i want to to choose but it's a hierarchy in classrooms and so the kids who get the a they're often overlooked honestly in classrooms right The kids who are failing are definitely overlooked. The kids in the middle, they get all the attention. So this hierarchy, um, what you begin to see is kids who get A's, they start to do bad because they want attention. They want support. They want someone to make sure that they're okay. And the kids who are failing, they just continue to do what they're doing because no one cares anyway. So that self-fulfilled prophecy kind of, you know, takes its corner, right? Um, But how do we change that narrative for kids and spaces and adults? Because I think you just brought up something else. Like adults struggle with that too because they've been groomed like that for so long as kids. One of the things that's always interesting for me in working with adults is you'll be like, hey, you showed up late to work three times. And they're like, well, I'm not a bad person. I really, and like they jump there. But it comes from all this labeling that we've always done over time. And then I, something else that just came up for me is this concept in math of showing your work. Because even if you don't think it through in the right way, you get that X, yep. right? And yep. that, that problem, you may get half credit. And so like we want folks, we want kids to think about things in a very specific way. It has to align with us. And if not, then they get the F and they're a bad student, right? And then I think about, again, my employees and them trying to guess what it is that I want as opposed to doing their own thing sometimes. Again, it's, we've groomed it into them to like think this way. It's a robot generation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like I programmed you, this is how you're gonna do it, and this is the output, right? My input equals your output. Um, and again, um, I don't know. I think for me, it's it's helpful to sit in space. I call it sparring. Um, and it makes people uncomfortable to sit in a room, or I call it the think tank, right? In the think tank, we spar. We just come with ideas and we throw them on the table. And they're like, well, what do you want me to do? I don't know. Let's just figure it out together. And that's a scary space for 
educators, people, adults, young and old, to sit in. It's just, let's do some inquiry, right? Mm -hmm. And if, if I go back to your previous question around um, what's the ideal, if we can make a classroom, it will be inquiry-based, right? Like, mm -hmm. just let's discover, right? Yeah, we can have some boundaries and some structures to it, but let's just discover, right? Today, what do we want to talk about? Or we're planning this unit. What do we want the unit to be on? Or we're planning this project for the, the district. What do we think they need, right? Let's just, let's do some investigation around it. It's a scary space because it's not predictable. Mm -hmm. And when it's not predictable, it's not gonna work. It's not true. Sometimes you, I get some of my best answers from sitting in a room of other like-minded and non-like-minded mm -hmm. people because I also like people to push my process because mm -hmm. I think I'm smart and intelligent. I can, <laughs> I can reason pretty well. But when I have someone say, well, what did you think about this? I'm like, you know what? I didn't think about that, right? Mm -hmm. That investigation allows for curiosity to um, come to the forefront. And you get your best. I think you get your best then when curiosity is at play. And I think teaching that to folks at a really young age is really important because it doesn't mean that you're being challenged as a person. And that's another thing that I've noticed people are, like you said, very uncomfortable with. But like, again, I was 15 having full on debates with folks. Um, I, one of my favorite debates is whether humans were meant to eat meat. And that was a really intense conversation that we were just debating, but it allowed you to be able to talk to folks that were different from you yeah, and be able to sit with that and see it as this one conversation and not really attribute it to a person and who they are necessarily. I agree. So um, given everything that we've talked about today, what do you feel like we can do for moving forward? Like how do we create, what do we need to change and how do we create change? I think we have to start with the adults, the decision makers, those that are in power um, to begin to think differently about how we approach education. I'll be the first to say I don't have all the answers. I don't. Um, but I think I have been afforded the opportunity to lead and do some great work with other great educators in my school um, where we did some unconventional things because I could um, and we thought outside of the box. Once we removed the box and there's no box, we were you know good to go. So I think starting there, those that are up top, the heavy decision makers, those that really enforce what happens to the little people on the bottom. Um, I think starting there with challenging um, and sparking curiosity in a way where we step away. Um, I think uh, Ron, uh, Ron Heifetz says it best, like going on the balcony to really assess what's happening down there on the dance floor. When you're on the dance floor and everyone's on the same level, you don't really see who's not dancing. You don't really see you know, that couple over there in the corner arguing, like you just see people dancing. But when you go on the balcony, you get a better viewpoint of what's really happening on the floor. And I just think senior leadership in school districts, superintendents, um, those that make the, the big decisions need to go on the balcony to really investigate and um, be curious and begin to question in a different way what we're doing. Um, because just because we've been doing it this way for this long doesn't mean it's the best way moving forward. And really challenging that and asking ourselves those critical questions. Um, I think the other thing we could do moving forward is ask those that are most impacted by our decisions for real feedback before we implement something else. What I find is that we do, um, we ask for feedback on things, but it's after we've decided Mm -hmm. where we're headed so I'm asking you for feedback on something that is already in motion but bring those constituents to the table first and foremost to start those curious conversations so that as you're thinking about I think I want to move in this direction what do you think and how will this impact you the most because I think one of the things we're definitely missing is we've removed from our decision making who it impacts the most um, even though we say we are we don't make consideration for that, that kid on the south and the west side of Chicago who generally doesn't have voice at the table. Um, we, need their, we need their voice at the table and not just their voice, their parents and those community members that are most impacted by our decisions. Um, and I think if we go there, we'll begin to see some different things happening in the schools because they'll tell you what they want and need. The question is, will we listen? 
Yeah, I think that one is about folks not wanting their norm interrupted. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's comfortable. Mm -hmm. It's comfortable. It's funny because we acknowledge that it's not working, but none of us want to be so uncomfortable that we completely disrupt it. It's uncomfortable and scary to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, but I think that's the only way we're going to see real change is being uncomfortable to the point where my stomach is bubbling, Mm -hmm. I'm sweating, I don't like it, I need a break. But until we get there, yeah. All right. And do you have social media or anything where folks can find you and support you? I do. Um, I can be found on Instagram um, at Dr. Cynthia Leeds. Um, also on Facebook, same handle, Dr. Cynthia Leeds. Um, it's where I sometimes pro- you know, promote and uh, speak on provocative things. Or just post funny memes. It just depends. <laughs> so it's, it's a wide variety, but that's where you can find me. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here today and chatting with me. Thank you. If you're enjoying this episode, we have a few upcoming events that will be perfect for you. Join Alternatives and Broken Office Chair on October 5th at Chicago United for Equity for our second Cocktails and Complicity event. Guest speakers Ioka Samuels and Leslie Honoré from Broken Office Chair Season 1 will join Bessie in discussing the complex dynamics that perpetuate inequality in the nonprofit sector such as being a woman of color in nonprofit leadership, the nonprofit industrial complex, the intersection of capitalism and philanthropy, and much more. Come enjoy a cocktail, network with nonprofit friends, and engage in these much needed conversations. The link to RSVP will be in the show's notes. Have you been personally impacted by a toxic nonprofit? Do you have a nonprofit horror story you're dying to share? Then join us for Nightmare Before Christmas, an in person open mic night where nonprofit friends can gather and share horror stories about navigating the nonprofit industrial complex. Come prepared with your favorite story, poem, or song about the terrors of funder site visits, annual appeals, audits, and more. We invite you to share a drink with colleagues and revel in the joys of nonprofit life. The link to RSVP will also be in the show's notes. Keep up with everything going on at Alternatives or to donate, you can visit us at our website, alternativesyouth.org. You can also follow us at Alternatives Inc. on Instagram or at Alternatives Youth on Facebook. If you want to keep up with Bessie, you can follow her on Instagram and TikTok at Bessie underscore Alcantara. Broken Office Chair is hosted by Alternatives Executive Director Bessie Alcantara. It's produced, researched, and edited by Catherine Bess and Deanna Phillips. Thanks for listening.